On Memorial Day weekend of 2003, a group of children was riding their bikes through the trails along the Delaware River in Fishtown, Philadelphia, without care in the world. That is, until they noticed something strange on the ground. Something that looked like bloody pieces of bones. Of course, the remains could have been from some kind of animal that had met its end recently. But there was something else that did not exactly fit that picture. As the youngsters kept moving forward, they stumbled upon the rest of the body. But instead of fur, they saw clothes. Welcome to the True Crime Never Sleeps podcast. I am your host, Larry Least. On today's episode of Murder Monday, we dive into the brutal murder of Jason Sweeney. But first, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Audible, for sponsoring this episode. If you're a fan of audiobooks from any kind of genre, and you want a free audiobook and free 30-day trial, head on over to audibletrial.com slash Larry21. Without further ado, let's dive right in. So as the police arrived at the scene shortly after, they confirmed children had indeed discovered a body of a man. But due to the horrible injuries, they could not say much more, not even if this person was young or old. The bloody pieces along the trail proved to be bits of facial bone in addition to several teeth. The amount of violence used on the victim was just an unimaginable. Hoping for a quick identification, the investigators searched the victim's pockets and his wallet but found nothing. There was no ID and no money. So while the authorities still did not know who this John Doe was, they now had an idea of the motive. It seemed like the victim had been lured to the wooded area and robbed. But how much money he must have had to have someone come after it with such brutality? The subsequent autopsy revealed that the Delaware River John Doe had died within the last 24 hours and was just a teenager. A young man who should have still had his whole life ahead of him. The medical examiner could only estimate the number of times the victim had been hit. But it was dozens, and the killer or killers had used several different weapons. At least a hatchet and a rock, most of the young man's devastating injuries were on the right, top, and front sides of his head. Literally, every other bone in the victim's face was broken, except his left cheekbone. There was no way even the teenager's parents could have recognized their son anymore. But fortunately, another unrelated injury helped John Doe to get his name back. As the police checked the list of people who had gone missing in the area lately, they found a report of a 16-year-old boy who was said to have a fresh scar on his hand. Just like John Doe, the detectives immediately contacted the family and the boy's father, Paul Sweeney, headed to the county morgue on Monday, June 1st, 2003. While Paul did not get to see the victim's face, he recognized the scar caused by a construction work accident. The body belonged to his son, Jason Sweeney. But how, and, and why had the 16-year-old ended up on a metal slab in a morgue? So to start at the beginning, Jason Keel Sweeney was born July 29, 1986 in Philadelphia. He grew up in a classic working-class neighborhood of Fishtown with his younger sister, Melissa. The siblings were fortunate enough to have caring and loving parents. His father Paul was a contractor who owned a local construction company, and mother Don, who was a bank teller. The Sweeney's raised a son who was described as a gentle soul, a sweet, kind person, who was popular among his peers and always willing to help others. As her mother said, and I quote, he was the kid that in the schoolyard, if he saw someone being bullied, he would intervene. Jason did eventually drop out of school in 11th grade, but not without having a plan. First, he wanted to follow in his father's footsteps and begin working in the family business. But while Jason enjoyed the job in construction, it was really just a way to make some money to achieve his biggest dream. Become a Navy SEAL? <clears throat> and studying at Valley Forge Military School. So you could say 16-year-old Jason Sweeney had a lot going for him. There should not have been any question about whether or not the hard-working and easy-going teenager 
would achieve his goals, and yet his parents had begun to have a bad feeling. So about six years earlier, during the fourth grade, Jason had met a boy named Edward Batsig Jr. The two got along very well and soon became best friends. During the years, Edward was one of Jason's closest companions, even traveling with the Sweeney family on holiday to Florida. However, it was after that trip that Paul and Don agreed something had changed in Edward. They felt that their son's best friend had fallen in with the wrong crowd and was dragging Jason with him. Still, the parents knew they could not completely forbid their son from seeing his friend. But they did suggest Jason a limited time at Edward's company. You can only imagine how happy the Sweeney's were when Jason then revealed in 2003 that she was seeing someone. Of, or, excuse me, he was seeing someone. 15-year-old girl named Justina Morley. Perhaps a romantic relationship was all that was needed to keep him out of trouble. Sadly, just a few weeks later, Paul and Don learned that their son's girlfriend was the worst thing that ever happened to him. So after talking with Jason's parents, the detectives learned the 16-year-old had plans with his girlfriend. On the day he disappeared, but as Jason was the only one found dead in the woods, where was Justina? The police quickly tracked down the girl who was found totally unharmed and claimed she did not know anything about what had happened to Jason. But the thing is, even though she did not want to talk, her friends could not keep their mouths shut. Soon, the detectives discovered it was not just Jason's new girlfriend who had conspired to kill him, but his best friend too. Not before long, the police had Edward Batsig and two other teenagers, six-year-old Nicholas and 17-year-old Dominic. In custody, and unlike Justina, they had a lot to say. Based on the statements and the evidence found at the scene, the authorities were now able to piece together the final moments of Jason Sweeney. <laughs> Excuse me. So on Friday, May 30th, 2003, Jason finished work early, even more excited than usual. He was going to meet with Justina for a date. At about 4 p.m., Jason grabbed his $500 paycheck and headed to pick up Justina from her home on East Palmer Street. At first, the young lovers hung around town, Jason buying a soda for Justina from a corner store. Shortly after, the 15-year-old came up with another, more adventurous idea. Justina suggested they move to a more private location to the trails along the Delaware River. She did not need to say much for Jason to understand why they would go to that specific or remote location. There, they could get physical without anybody bothering them. So the teenagers made their way to the trails, where Justina then immediately began to get rid of her clothes. Jason followed her example and removed his shoes, but just as he unzipped his trousers, something unexpected happened. Three young men suddenly emerged behind the trees, and to his confusion, Jason realized he knew all of them. He had just enough time to see the face of Edward and the two other teenagers, brothers Nicholas and Dominic, before they attacked him. Edward, the one who had been Jason's best friend for years, struck the 16-year-old in the head repeatedly with a hatchet, at least four or five times. Needless to say, Jason knew this was not some prank or a play fight between friends. No, his best friend was clearly trying to kill him, while Jason begged for his life. The two brothers stepped in and continued hitting him with a hatchet, a hammer, and a rock until no more sound came from their victim. Until there were no more facial features left that could have revealed this person once was Jason Sweeney. All while, Justina stood there and watched how the boy she had lured to the woods was brutally beaten to death. Once the four teenagers were sure Jason was not going to get up again, they emptied his pockets, taking the $500 paycheck. The reason why the 16-year-old had lost his life? Just so Justina, Edward, and Nicholas, and Dominic could each have $125 to buy drugs and party. After their senseless act, the teenagers had a group hug and headed to Dominic's best friend, 18-year-old Joshua Stobbs' house, where they washed their bloody clothes before heading out to get marijuana, heroin, and cocaine. Dominic later described what they did by saying they partied beyond redemption. 
As the legal proceedings then started in June 2003, Justina Morley's lawyers tried their best to minimize her implication in the murder and use her rough past, past as defensive strategy. According to Justina's mother, April Frederick, her daughter started self-harming at the age of 10. At the same age, she began experimenting with drugs. In 2002, Justina was hospitalized for threatening suicide, after which she continued to have issues with self-mutilation and narcotics. The teenager should have stayed in the hospital for a long time, but as Justina threatened to commit suicide if her mother would not let her come home, April did not have another choice but take her out, and things only kept getting worse. Unbeknownst to Jason, Justina used sex as a tool to get drugs. Just a few days before the brutal attack, she slept with both Edward and Nicholas in exchange for heroin. Afterward, all three and Dominic plotted how to kill Jason Sweeney and get his money by using Justina as bait. <clears throat> Excuse me. Due to her young age, difficult past, including depression, suicide attempts, and substance abuse, Justina's lawyers argued she should get a juvenile court trial. But the thing is, even though Justina did not touch Jason, she was solely responsible for taking her, taking him to the trails while no, knowing very well he was walking to his death. So Justina's role in the senseless attack was significant, and her past only proved that treatments had not worked. On top of that, the prosecution had gotten their hands in the letters Justina had written behind bars, which were not just sexually explicit, but also included claims of her enjoying flashbacks of the murder describing herself as a cold-hearted, devil-worshipping bitch. Not exactly words of a person feeling remorse. In the end, the judge decided Justina Morley was to be tried as an adult. Unsurprisingly, she then chose to plead guilty to third-degree murder in exchange for testifying against her accomplices. Edward, Dominic, and Nicholas were tried together as adults for first-degree murder, conspiracy, robbery, and possessing an instrument of crime. According to Dominic's confession, they had prepared for the murder by listening to the Beatles song Helter Skelter over 40 times. But despite being drug addicts, they were sober that day. The trio attempted to portray Justina as the ringleader who had come up with the murderous plan. But that did not erase the fact that they all used their own hands and several tools to destroy Jason Sweeney's head and the lives of his loved ones. It was also Edward who had known what Jason would get his paycheck. As you can guess, all three were convicted on all charges in May 2005. Edward Batzig and Nicholas and Dominic received a mandatory life sentence without the possibility of parole. And what about Justina? Thanks to the deal she made, Justina Morley was convicted of lesser charges and sentenced to 17 and a half to 35 years in prison. After 17 years behind bars, she was released on December 10th, 2020. Hopefully she will make better decisions and appreciate her second chance in life. Unlike Justina Donnell has a possibility to do, Jason Sweeney never got to pursue his dreams. But his parents have not yet, have not let them be forgotten. Paul and Don set up the Jason Keel Sweeney Foundation to fund a full scholarship for the Valley Forge Military Academy in college. And even took a piece of Jason's hair to the Empire State Building. As Don said, quote, and everywhere I go that Jason wanted to go, I'm going to cut off a piece of his hair and leave it there. So a piece of him is there, and in kind of a metaphoric way, he will have seen the Empire State Building. Let us know your thoughts on this case. Um, if you want to support the channel, you can buy us coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash TCNS. As always, you can find us on Good Pods, iTunes, Amazon, or anywhere you get your podcasts from. Thank you so much for watching and listening. We will see you next time. Take care.